So in our panel, we have physicians from Georgia, New York, uh, Vermont, New Hampshire, Maryland. And what we're highlighting is that all of us have to some degree engaged with stakeholders in the healthcare system, with suppliers who dispense cannabis to our patients. Uh, we monitor our patients for benefits and for harms that could be caused from the cannabis itself. And many of us to some degree have been engaged in research to basically see what's happening to our patients who are using cannabis products. Georgia first passed their law in 2015. So that's when the supportive um, care clinic started to um, register people on the cannabis oil registry. So for that long, um, and as more partners have come into our practice, particularly Dr. Saravi, and our pain, um, interventional pain practice, has really taken the lead in research um, for Emory. I would say that, you know, given the history, um, it's a very complex history of cannabis um, in this country, and um, it's been considered a taboo substance for so long um, that now it's there, it's experiencing a resurgence um, in popularity, and we're seeing firsthand the effects on quality of life um, on our patients. So although this is a historically very old medicine, it seems like a new up-and-coming medicine these days because of the uh, the illegality of cannabis for so long in this country. So it's exciting to see the effects um, on people and their, and their livelihood and their quality of life. For me, what's so interesting is that people approach cannabis with a diversity of perspectives. Some place a great deal of faith in it that it's going to really be the panacea to all their problems, that it may cure their diseases. And they hear things from all sorts of people, from, from media, that it can, it can really help them. I think we as physicians and, and practitioners, especially in palliative medicine, should also be concerned about the side effects, the harms, and long-term follow-up of our patients. So what's most interesting to me is that we have laws in this country that are liberalizing access to cannabis without necessarily having the medical evidence base to support it. So I think we as a community can come together to really take research seriously to see how cannabis can and, and may not benefit our patients as well, like any other drug. And I think there's a, a, a really wide space to do really good education. Um, the, the more evidence that comes out about medical cannabis, the more we look at it, um, we're starting to see drug interactions. and. And I think because the patients are coming through palliative care, this is a great way for us to educate our colleagues about cannabinoids and how they interact with other medications. What, what does that actually mean when your patient's on them? What do you do in the hospital when they're taking it? How do we put it on the, um, the medical records and to make it as safe as possible to make sure we're using, that our patients are using it appropriately? And also our partners are educating and using appropriately. And then we have the opportunity to help develop informed consents like with any other um, with any other supplement or treatment a patient chooses um, to use. We also have to educate in the space of if it's not considered um, federally legal, what does that mean? What are the risks to our patients? So if we're, we're, we're asking them to use this, what does that mean for jobs and work? Um, what does that mean for driving? Um, at what level can you drive? You know, so these are all questions that are left not answered, but they have profound effects. So we have to move beyond, hey, this is going to make you feel better, to how do you actually operationalize it to make sure that it's not only at what, what are going to be the effects in their physical lives, but what's also their effects in their social lives. And we would not want to cause harm because we didn't properly educate. What's so interesting about cannabis is that it has such profound social, medical, um, psychosocial, and uh, societal implications um, from multiple perspectives. I think it's the, inter uh, as Ali Jones said, the intersection of faith and hope. Um, when people speak about medical cannabis, um, they often speak about it um, in a way that that's not evidence-based. There's a belief that this is going to help me. So if I pray hard enough, then this is going to help me. This, if I go to this doctor, if I do this ritual, this is going to help me. And they speak about that in that way. And I think um, in our profession, we're used to working with patients who have hope and reframing hope into what's 
um, possible and what what's um, realistic without um, damaging that. So when we're speaking about medical cannabis and their hope is that it's going to cure, we don't say no, that it's not going to do that. What we do is we show them what the data says, we support them, and then we provide the education. Um, often patients will need other palliative care skills and other palliative care um, symptom, um, symptom management that, that they may not otherwise get if they're worried about coming, but they will come to discuss medical cannabis. So it's almost like a gateway drug to palliative care. I think palliative care is a natural entry point mm -hmm. uh, for these discussions because we are seen as the quality of life practitioners. So patients might hear from loved ones, friends, through um, an online blog that cannabis helped with something, with pain, nausea, vomiting, appetite, and then they come to us to, to guide them about how to use it, how to access it, and to potentially decriminalize it for them in the form of a medical marijuana card, for example. So I think it's really incumbent upon the AHPM community and for nurse practitioners and physicians to really familiarize themselves with the science and the politics of medical cannabis. What I found interested in my practice in, um, in, in the cancer center where I work is um, the oncologists are probably just as uncomfortable with uh, making a palliative care referral as they are for, um, on the topic of cannabis. So if their patients come in asking about medical cannabis, which um, we're seeing is highly, highly increasing over time, um, they tend to make the referral to myself or my other colleague um, who also does palliative care and medical cannabis, and they're coming um, in to see us for, for cannabis certification, but they end up usually continuing and staying on and following with us um, for the palliative care aspect of their management as well. So it's really, a, like Ali John said, an entryway to, um, to palliative care. Right, and I can speak for, for myself and for and I hope for Diana that we were we, recent, we recently completed our palliative medicine fellowships and we did not think that medical cannabis would become part of our practice. It really happened once we were inundated with patients mm -hmm. with questions and, and almost demands for access to cannabis and to have someone watch over them and to condone it in some way. And I found it very rewarding to really manage my patients, watch for side effects, counsel them, and then keep them in our palliative care setting for all their other symptom needs. And, and I think the unifying message we have in our presentation and among the six states that we have represented in our, in our AHPM presentation is that it really has become a gateway drug to a palliative care consultation. Mm -hmm. I hope to um, put forward that medical cannabis or cannabis itself is not um, a taboo drug. Um, there is um, there is data to support its use, especially in the palliative care patient. Um, there is a lack of research, and we are all aware of that. Um, and you know, in order to push forward to do good quality research, um, we have to really look at a legal uh, level of, of descheduling uh, de or rescheduling of, of cannabis. I hope that people can gain um, that from our talk, um, sort of demystifying cannabis. My take home point for, for people wanting to incorporate medical cannabis into their ambulatory palliative care practice is transparency. So identifying your key stakeholders, meeting with risk management and their legal team to make sure that you are complying with state laws and that everything you are doing is consistent with that. And um, the more partners you have, the more successful you will be at incorporating it into your practice. I think education, education of providers and that we have to recognize that we have to know. It's not anyone else's problem. We can't send somebody else to do this. Um, whether or not we choose to participate in helping patients um, register or um, recommend, we at least need to be able to have the conversation and have the conversation with openness to allow the patients to not feel marginalized. Also, to understand, I think their presentation is going to show the complexity and the differences in the states and why we need um, better laws federally to make sure that we're not creating un and having this new product not having healthcare disparities where we have parts of the country that are able to access a, a 
uh, something that could be potentially helpful in other parts of the country not able to, forcing patients to make very tough choices financially um, and, and socially um, that, that end up causing harm when we're trying to help. The reality on the ground is that patients are increasingly using cannabis products mm -hmm. to address the symptoms and stress of their serious illness, mm -hmm. which is exactly what we in palliative care are set out to accomplish. I think the importance of, number one, understanding your law and understanding the laws of other states, particularly as um, ill patients move about the country seeking new treatments, um, it's going to be our onus to and provide them with informed consent and to let them know what their risks are. Um, and number, number two, um, really getting at providers really understanding um, how the cannabinoid system actually works and being educated. So as our patients get more and more complicated treatments, um, really understanding how cannabinoids interact with those treatments so we're not unintentionally um, um, creating harm.